So warm welcome to uh, everyone tuning into our Transformer State conversation uh, series on digital government and uh, human rights. Uh, I'm glad to say that this is already our 10th uh, conversation in this uh, series. So we have a little bit of an anniversary uh, uh, here. Uh, and for each conversation, as, uh, as some of you might know, uh, my colleagues and I at the Digital Welfare State and Human Rights Project uh, interview a human rights practitioner, uh, academic or other expert on a specific case study of digital government and its implications for human rights for about an hour. Uh, and as those of you who joined us uh, in the past will know, one of our aims with this series is to introduce a wider audience of human rights students, academics and practitioners, as well as other interested audiences uh, to the implications of digital government for uh, human rights. And uh, that also brings me to a second objective uh, with our conversation series, uh, and that is to uh, inspire the formation of a community of practice of people who are interested in uh, the advent of the digital state and are interested in its consequences for human rights. And uh, through these conversations, uh, but also through regular blog posts we have on our website, um, we hope to serve as a hub for interesting exchange of information and conversation on the rise of the digital state. Now today, we will discuss Singapore's Smart Nation initiative uh, with our guest, Monami uh, badra -Haines. Uh, And this initiative is a fascinating case study of turning a city, or in this case, uh, a city-state, uh, into a so-called smart city. And by turning Singapore into a city of sensors, its government is able to collect information on, and I quote, everyone, everything, everywhere, all the time. And by filling the whole island with sensors and apps that collect data and by analyzing and using that data, uh, the government of Singapore is turning its territory into, uh, and I quote again, living laboratory. And with our guests, uh, we will discuss the promised benefits of this smart city state, uh, but also how this urban tech utopia and its preferences for uh, experimentation uh, affects a significant number of migrant workers in Singapore. Uh, and we will also discuss the resistance uh, against the Smart Nation Initiative and how uh, to place this within the larger political transformation that's happening in Singapore and the accompanying uh, reimagination of citizenship in this smart city. Now, at the outset, I should say uh, that this conversation will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel and webpage uh, afterwards. And I would also like to remind our audiences uh, that if you have a question, uh, you can use the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen. And I would like to ask you to ask uh, questions throughout this conversation. So we collect quite a few and we will spend the last 15 minutes uh, of today's hour um, asking those questions to, uh, to Mon Ami. Now, let me hand it over to my uh, wonderful colleague, uh, Victoria Adelman, who is also the driving force uh, behind this Transformer State conversation series. Thank you very much, Christian, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, it's wonderful to have you here. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Monami Badra Haynes is an assistant professor of science and technology studies at the Technical University of Denmark, and she was previously an assistant professor at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. She researches at the intersections of surveillance energy and equity, and is working on a book on anti-nuclear activism in India. Monami has done great research on the technologies of surveillance, such as contact tracing technologies, wastewater surveillance, and so-called digital energy twins. And she has published an excellent article about the making of the smart nation in Singapore, which I highly recommend that you all read. And Christian is going to post a link to it now in the chat um, so that that's available for you. Now, today's conversation is going to cut across several different issues, um, surveillance, technology, and the treatment of migrant populations. And we'll be looking at these issues within the specific context of Singapore. And I wonder if we can start with some background before we get into the specifics of uneven technological surveillance in the smart city. So Monami, could you tell us about the political and social environment in the city-state of Singapore to help us understand the pre-existing structures and inequalities on top of which these smart city technologies have been built? Um, let me just say, first of all, before I start a little bit on that question, thank you so much for having me. And I also want to mention that 
you know, that great research hasn't really been published yet. I'm still working on it, but <clears throat> I am going to be talking a little bit about that research and I'll be drawing on some really great scholars who've been working in that area as well. And I think at some point in the YouTube um, uh, video upload, you're going to be posting some of those links. So uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, uh, to letting me represent some of my work and that of others. So just to answer your question, I think it might be good to start off with a brief history of Singapore that touches on some aspects of social organization and technology. And I just know that when I was in Singapore, I was quite ignorant about a lot of things before I lived there for three years. So this might be helpful. So Singapore is an um, island city uh, state. It's a nation that's on the Southern tip of the Malay Peninsula in Southeast Asia. And it's been nicknamed, it calls itself the little red dot. Uh, it only encompasses only about a 280 square miles. And Singapore is a former British colony that was beginning in uh, 1819, so for a very long time. And after many twists and turns that included the Japanese occupation during World War II and a brief merging with Malaysia, Singapore be finally became a fully independent and sovereign nation um, under its first prime minister, Lee Kuan Yew, in 1965. So, and just to give you a sense of the um, ethnic diversity there, uh, even before colonization, Singapore was a very multi-ethnic place with traders coming from all over the uh, archipelago. And um, <clears throat> during colonial times, uh, during co colonization, uh, the British had migrants coming in from Southern China, the Malay Peninsula and India. And so all of this to say is that um, unlike Western understandings of multiculturalism, Singapore has been managing the potentials and challenges of diversity for a very long time. And so one of the ways it's done so is by adopting the so-called CMIO model or the Chinese, Malay, Indian, and other. And a lot of scholars have called this something like racial governmentality. You know, the race is sort of the superstructure here. And although the Singapore uh, region was quite diverse, it was shaped by the British and then the post-colonial government to have a Chinese majority and primarily Muslim Malays and Hindu Indians as the, the minorities. And through the language of multiculturalism, Singapore um, has institutionalized these colonial era um, racial categories in all kinds of policies and housing and education. <coughs> and um, so when you add to this existing milieu you have a large influx in, in um, recent years, in the past few decades, of migrant laborers. And they're ranging from the so-called lower skilled labor uh, to those who are white collar workers, which I was one when I was there, uh, who can refer to themselves as expats, you know, uh, that's a very, um, you know, that, that's a very interesting term, who you can call an expat. So in a population of 5.6 million, Foreigners are making up about 33, about a third of the workforce, um, <clears throat> numbering in about 1.5 million in 2019. And most of these people are um, these low wage transient male and female migrant workers who are working in as a domestic workers or in construction. And so who does what kind of work is highly racialized and gendered? Immigration is regulated through these racialized tiers of permits and passes that create what scholars have called differential inclusion. So women from Southeast Asia, for example, such as the Philippines or Myanmar, um, are hired on as domestic workers and men from India, Bangladesh, and China are hired on as construction or marine workers. And so, you know, so you can probably tell that migrant workers, especially migrant construction workers, they occupy the bottom tier um, of this hierarchy and they experience a great deal of precarity. They're often facing heavy debt from paying back loans for having to come back to come to work in Singapore, not being able to access family reunification or have pathways to citizenship and permanent residency. Um, and also they can't uh, fully move around freely in the country and they're subject to surveillance, which is something I'll be talking about. <laughs> and they've long lived in these um, purpose-built dorms that are uh, populated you know, around the island. 
and they travel to work sometimes if they don't live on site in these open air lorries. And so long before the pandemic, they've been subject to heavy surveillance and random ID checks in places like Little India and widespread CCTV surveillance. And of course, um, in, in, in most of these contexts, we see there's a lot of stereotyping and racism, and especially during the pandemic where they uh, were treated as uh, not just only moral threats, you know, because they're stereotyped as being drinking too much or, um, you know, being violent, but also as viral threats of being uh, viral vectors. So that's sort of the social part of it. So just to get to the technological part, I know I'm taking a lot of time here, but I just want to make sure that people understand a little bit more. And it's hard to do Singapore justice in such a short time. But Singapore is not only a diverse society, but it's also a very high tech society. You may have seen pictures of Marina Bay Sands and you know, Gardens by the Bay and all of these iconic pictures of Singapore. And it's also you know, um, a soft authoritarian or a soft democratic one, depending upon which term you prefer. So from the time that <coughs> Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew took the reins, technological and economic development with an eye towards carving a strategic space in the world economy where Singapore is seen as politically stable and a safe harbor for global investment. That's been integral to Singapore politics. So under the People's Action Party or the PAP, Singapore has used top-down policies to build Singapore up in a very short span of time. I mean, people have really seen that as a, as, as a miraculous undertaking, but Although we think of top-down as being, you know, when we think top-down, we think coercion, we think it's very coercive. And, and certainly there's an, a big element of that in Singapore politics, but there is also the social contract between the Singapore government and its citizens, primarily on the government's ability to deliver on public services in health and education and housing and the like. And this social contract is undergirded by this ideological construction of pragmatism where citizenship is framed um, narrowly somewhat in economic terms and how much one contributes to the national economy. And technology is very much part and parcel of these initiatives. So the government asks people to be hardworking, disciplined, productive, even docile workers and consumers for a capitalist economy. You know, people are socialized as citizens to not rock the boat and concede some civil liberties. And in return, people will get, you know, this hyper, this hyper modern technological nation with good schools, decent housing, access to good health, and a strong economy. And for the government, the smart nation is a, a mechanism, it's an it's infrastructure that will help it in its eyes to fulfill their end of the contract. So I hope, I know that was a lot, but I hope that kind of helped set the stage for what's to come. No, that was really excellent. Thank you so much, Monami, for that really comprehensive and helpful introduction to the political, social and technological kind of context here. Now, you just mentioned the so-called Smart Nation Initiative um, at the end of your answer there. And I want to take us there now so that we kind of introduce our audience to the, the, the smart city, the smart nation in Singapore. Um, I imagine that our audience does already have an understanding a general understanding of what a smart city is, um, but just in a sentence, this is where the, the physical infrastructure of a city is combined with ubiquitous detection through various technologies, including sensors, as Christian mentioned at the beginning, and also with data analytics. And together, these technologies manage and coordinate urban life. Now, in these Transformer States conversations, we always like to start the conversation by examining the narratives that surround the specific digital government program that we're talking about and thinking about the ways in which there is genuine promise in these kinds of initiatives. So could you explain to us, first of all, what the Smart Nation program is and how this initiative is sold to the general public in Singapore? So what are the promises, the narratives and the sort of visions behind this project? Absolutely. Um, and I just want to apologize to the audience that I'm coughing a lot. I'm battling a cold. Don't think it's COVID, but I mean, whatever. I don't know. But just so so apologies for my uh, perpetual coughing. So, yes. Um, the smart city initiatives are, 
you know, like all smart city initiatives around the world, um, Singapore's Smart Nation project is part of this longer arc, this longer trajectory of really accelerating and intensifying societies. Um, how societies are already networked through technological infrastructure. So it's not a new thing. I think it's an intensification. That's what people have talked about it like that. <laughs> In Singapore, uh, people have written how the smart nation was even, you know, uh, prefigured as early as 1992, even before that's when you, you had language about it in documents about the National Computer Board that saw the development of a very well connected information infrastructure. So the smart nation was unveiled very recently in 2014. And a lot of people saw it as a way to do what I talked about earlier in the social contract of to compete for the status as a global city, a global nation. And the smart nation should be seen as a continuation of how Singapore has tried to uh, secure this sort of geopolitical positioning. Um, you've had different sort of um, instantiations of it, incarnations of it, like the intelligent island or the intelligent nation, a knowledge-based economy and the biopolis. And the smart nation is the, the, the latest sort of incarnation of this. But to, as you, as you mentioned, Victoria, to make this vision concrete, it has to be seen as legitimate by the public. So most smart city initiatives follow very similar narratives of the importance and impact of, 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 of why they need to exist. And they're about increasing economic opportunities, job creation in the knowledge economy, creating convenience and efficiency, that's a really big one. Um, and that can be things like sustainable energy uh, and better care for the elderly and connecting citizens to the government. That's also a, a crucial one as well. And they apply to Singapore's smart nation too. <laughs> in Singapore, there's a lot of investment in smart homes and smart energy meters. Um, and, you know, there was even, I was uh, looking at, at that, you know, talking about elderly care there was a way that you could create flooring, you know, within a house where people can monitor your parents' electricity usage to see what they're doing to surveil them. So, I mean, these are all part of the smart city and uh, smart nation initiative. So the idea is to have perfect information relevant to our everyday lives at all times. Everything that's mundane from public transportation to, you know, seeing uh, where your parents are at, you know, whether they're making tea or using the toilet or something, or how crowded malls are, or, um, you know, having a centralized uh, personal data for your medical and financial records. And, uh, and I have to say that this vision is quite enticing because for me, when I was in Singapore and I uh, landed in Changi Airport, it was, I was just amazed. It was such an amazing airport. I absolutely love the convenience of it where streamlining and efficiency was an art form and I could get in and out in 30 minutes, no matter what time of day. But, but, and I'm sure you kind of know where this is headed, but smart city initiatives are not just simply technical and economic endeavors. They're fundamentally techno-political ones as well because they serve to reconfigure the relationships between different publics their governments with each other and their urban environments. And this gets to the question of inclusion, of who gets to be included in the smart city. And here I wanna talk a little bit more about the margins where the migrant workers are. So in, in the Singapore case, there's been, you know, a lot of, you know, talk about what labor would look like. And Singapore really imagines this idea of light and liquid uh, labor of where you know, we can be part of this very, uh, this digital space, cyberspace, and labor can just be located there. And it really obscures other forms of physical labor, say, and, and, and how it's treated in Singapore. So there's an important question of how inclusive the smart nation is. And to just give you an example of, this is something that I talked about with my students in, in Singapore when I was there, a lot of families there have domestic workers and often these female domestic workers have, um, you know, they're armed with a simple mop and a broom and they're not uh, 
plugged in to the smart nation quite in that same way. So one of there, there are all these advertisements for these all knowing omniscient refrigerators that I guess make your life quite easy in a smart home. Um, how these women fit into that imagination, to that narrative leads to some cognitive dissonance. Um, how do, and in another example, I remember walking down Singapore and you would see migrant workers operating these very simple weed whackers as they would mow these huge expanses and swaths of grassland. And how would they fit, how do they fit into the smart nation? Because there is a premium on cheap labor and there are technologies that are built to handle rough terrain and actually look this up. You can, you know, invest in technology that can handle different terrain for grass cutting. But if there's no incentive, you know, uh, to buy that, and you have all these people, then they're, how do they get plugged into the smart nation? So it's not just that the imagination of an exclusive smart nation that hides physical labor, <laughs> smart nation has the potential to also to hide accountability as well. So in this quest for continued political stability, and that's really key here, you know, digitalization and the esoteric and obscure world of data extraction, we're giving, we're just sloughing off data all the time. It's hard to know how one is being governed exactly through data and how to hold people responsible. So since data and technology are often regarded as neutral, which I think that idea is slowly shifting. I think it's, it's becoming more intuitive that it's not neutral, right? But at the same time, that can hide responsibility and accountability, which is a problem when it's merged into the state. So and the reasons for saying this is the, the idea of the smart nation is to connect citizens better to government. But paradoxically, because you can truly really peer into this data, you don't really know the way in which one is being governed. It can make public officials, officials even more distanced and less accessible and can lead to further alienation. Of course, I just want to end with the flip side of that, you know, platforms like Facebook allow for a very immediate um, repartee with uh, officials and things like that, but where you can get immediate responses, but it's still only a, a very small sliver of the way in which governance becomes visible. Thank you so much. That's uh, You've made some really interesting points. And I think the picture that you've painted as well of the sort of smart home with the, the ultra connected fridge and the female domestic worker kind of around it with a simple broom is, is a really powerful image in terms of showing some of the contrasts and the realities that really comprise what we're talking about here. Um, and before we get further into some of your important critiques and some of those themes of accountability and, and especially the specifics of the place of migrant workers in all of this, I wonder if you could very briefly situate us again kind of globally and tell us why it would be important to look to Singapore when we're thinking about smart cities perhaps all around the world. So Singapore has been hailed as the world's leading smart city. And does that mean that experiences in Singapore are idiosyncratic or do you think they're relevant for smart cities elsewhere? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I don't think they're idiosyncratic um, because Singapore and like Denmark where I am now, uh, especially in the coronavirus, uh, the pandemic management have been hailed as international models that for others to learn and emulate. <laughs> and for Singapore, that's very important when it comes to thinking about um, the smart city. So, you know, Singapore bills itself and it's often seen as a sort of this exceptional space that its unique history, its people, its cultures have allowed it to develop the way it has. And it's some that other countries look to learn from. And, you know, Western countries, uh, I, I remember just one little anecdote when I told people that I was going to live in Singapore, uh, for my American educated colleagues would say, oh, isn't that the place where they cane someone for chewing gum, right? And so uh, Westerners, when they think of Singapore, they have this often um, a very skewed idea of what it is, you know, a, a, perhaps even a techno-orientalist notion where they see uh, this hyper-technological modernity that they can look on in envy and awe, but also with distaste at its authoritarianism. But places like China, and that's some 
that's a country I know that we're very interested in, has a history of looking to and learning from the so-called Singapore model <laughs> as well um, for what it considers to be good governance through um, meritocratic authoritarianism, Singapore's quickly growing economy, and its perceived political stability without political liberalization. So in fact, it seems that Singapore is the only country that Chinese officials have claimed is actually a learning model, and that's a big deal. When Xi Jinping visited Singapore in 2015, he reiterated that you know, Singapore or China could learn from Singapore's governance style. And this is, uh, this is also true of the Smart Nation Initiative. Singapore has signed numerous partnership agreements with China for testing and further developing smart cities in China, such as you know, the very big technological powerhouse in Shenzhen in Southern China, or the business park of Suzhou, or the high-tech eco-island of Nanjing. So the Singapore China, the Shenzhen Smart City Initiative is supposed to deepen digital connectivity and trade, finance, cross-border data management, whatever that means, you know, and test out new ideas and policy innovations. So the fact that <clears throat> this, the smart nation lies as a backbone of the Singapore model is not incidental because both countries are really interested in building trustworthy systems, right? And trustworthy systems requires believing that decision-making infrastructures are and institutions are apolitical. So to this end, datafication and digitalization are then key components of building trustworthy infrastructures of this seemingly neutral decision-making because they ostensibly remove human fallibility and prejudice from the equation. Thanks, uh, Mon ami. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's very important that you've placed us into a historical and political context uh, because that's so often missing. Uh, when there's a focus on government digital transformation yet, as you uh, show, it's highly, uh, highly relevant. And uh, the other thing to note um, is that it's very important to look at what are the promises here, because it makes us better understand what the drivers are behind projects like this Smart Nation initiatives, including a geopolitical uh, a driver and including um, uh, uh, a social contract driver where you know citizens also expect ease of use from uh, from government and that's of course a key promise behind uh, digitalization i want to take our conversation now uh, to a bit of a, a the darker side of uh, of the smart smart nation um so from the um, uh, constellation of monitoring technologies that you've uh, described uh, it seems rather clear that surveillance uh, is a key aspect of smart city uh, initiatives and uh, this tech-driven urban management then relies on ubiquitous uh, data collection, as Victoria also said, and monitoring, uh, particularly through sensors. Um, now, we know from history, from case studies all around the world, including ones that we discussed here before in the Transformer State series, uh, that the impact of surveillance is never uh, uh, sort of even across a society and is experienced uh, and impacted uh, uh, differently uh, according to uh, which group you're talking about. So I wonder if you could explain the impact and the experience um, of the smart city on migrant workers in Singapore, a group that you've already mentioned and that's already facing, of course, uh, quite significant discrimination and unequal treatment in this, uh, in this city state. If I may, if I could answer this question by taking a, a little bit more of a historical perspective before the smart uh, nation was unveiled. Um, to talk about a time when there was a lot of intensification of surveillance of migrant workers. And this, one could maybe think of this as a turning point, was with the so-called Little India riot, even though a lot of scholars think that this might be an overstatement of what actually happened. So this is in 2013, and this is an enclave called Little India in Singapore, where migrant workers some of them live there who are not in the dorms and they shop there and they spend a lot of their free time uh, and their days off there. And what happened was that there was a fatal accident where a bus ran over an Indian construction worker who seemed to have been somewhat inebriated and was running after the bus and there was an accident, he got ran over. In the aftermath of the accident, a large group of migrant workers attacked the bus and the emergency vehicles uh, that arrived at the location. And the government, was very alarmed by this because it saw this as the, only the second riot to occur uh, post-independent Singapore. And as a result of this, 
you had the you saw the beginning of a whole host of security measures targeting migrant workers, most of whom were from South Asia. The incident, incident was seen as quite exceptional and therefore required exceptional measures to prevent it from ever happening again. Scholars have uh, called these measures um, the panopticon, like a play on panopticon, but with a B, to draw attention to how exclusion of people and communities seen as a high risk were normalized. So to ban people from certain kinds of spaces, right? And <clears throat> these measures really shaped the legal geography of Little India, of what one could or could not do. You had a ton of security cameras and biometric sen uh, sensors. The government coordinated a whole host of different information sources like cellular networks, social media, CCTV, transportation, lamp posts were installed with sensors. Um, and all of this was to generate data that was seen as relevant for national security. And it wouldn't take a lot of manpower because AI would monitor all this data and let a human know if there was something worth reporting. So this kind, these kind of measures would allow for the constant scientific surveillance of a population, especially the migrant workers. And it wasn't just technological, there were a whole bunch of policies as well, such as laws and norms of alcohol consumptions and how a, a consumption and how migrant workers could use public spaces. So outside of Little India and the dorms, uh, inside the dorms, this kind of surveillance was of course present. So as I mentioned, these dorms are usually in the outskirts of cities. So people are kept um, largely segregated socially and geographically from the so-called uh, Singaporean community. And this word community has surfaced a lot in the pandemic to differentiate between uh, the people living in dorms and those within uh, the Singapore body politic. So after the Little India accident, dormitories were no longer seen as private spaces, actually. They, they became seen as public spaces where people could be penalized for drinking or public disorder or fighting. And a lot of mid-level people were sort of mobilized like bus drivers, dorm operators, policemen, they were activated to keep order. And this actually happened during the pandemic as well. And after the incident, the government of course installed install a lot of CCTV and biometric security features. And in one mega dorm, they had um, fingerprints that were checked upon exit and entry. So during the pandemic, you know, where you can really see the smart nation, this is sort of the rubber hits the ground, smart nation and intersection of smart nation micro workers, <laughs> you had an intensification and consolidation of all of these um, existing surveillance uh, trajectories. Uh, perhaps some people in your audience might be aware of the two epidemiological curves that were created, one for those living in dorms and one for the Singapore community. And initially, um, it was mandatory for workers during the pandemic to download the Trace, to get the Trace Together app, which was an app that was assisting in contact tracing. The, it was Bluetooth enabled. And initially it was saying, it's not tracking your location. It's just providing associational data. So it's pinging off of other phones to see who one was with rather than where one was. Later, this Trace Together app took the form of a Trace Together token, which was a, a wearable app that you wore around your neck or carried. <clears throat> and later, this was combined with safe entry, which did give location data. So this is safe entry where you would go and scan in and you know uh, register that you have actually arrived at whatever store, wherever you've gone. So, you can think of all of this as sort of the surveillant assemblage that was coming together. And it combined one's immigration status and being cleared to work. And this did not all roll out smoothly. When the app was mandatory, for example, the app didn't work with Huawei phones. And so the military was involved in, uh, in, in uh, securing the dorms. And so a lot of workers were going up to police officers in the military to see if they could use their phones to you know, register uh, their uh, trace together token or trace together app so that they could actually be cleared to go to work. And there was a lot of confusion initially. And, and although this is not quite, uh, I mean, it, this data is digitally stored and is part of the surveillance assemblage, it's important to talk about 
the kind of pooled coronavirus testing that was going on that was supposed to assist in contact tracing. And, but often if you're in a dorm of 12 to 20 people and somebody gets sick, you're all tested, but then other people start getting sick. And each time someone gets sick, gets sick, your whole, your quarantine gets extended and extended. And some people were in isolation for weeks <clears throat> if that happened. So all of this to say is that the smart city doles out its benefits quite unevenly. And it's often contingent on being a citizen. And if one is considered part of the so-called Singaporean community. Thanks, uh, Mon ami. And uh, I'm sorry we're letting you talk so much, uh, given the fact that you have uh, have a call to have on myself. But I'm in the lucky position that I can just ask the questions and uh, <laughs> don't have to give the answers. Um, so as you said, um, it appears that migrant workers are subjected to more uh, surveillance and technological intervention than uh, the rest of the population in uh, Singapore and also subjected to those technologies differently. Uh, and also that that predates um, the pandemic, predates in, in some cases the Smart Nation initiatives. Now, something um, we see quite consistently in our work is not only the disproportionality of that, but also that there's a, a temporal element where certain technologies are only deployed on marginalized uh, populations, but then they're also deployed on this population first. And uh, I was wondering if you can tell us of specific instances where uh, smart city technology is being tested on the migrant population first, uh, or indeed tested only on this uh, uh, population. Yeah, so, so one of the things is like the things that are tested on in the migrant worker dorms eventually spill out to the rest of the community. <laughs> so when Trace Together was tested there, eventually we all um, got it, you know, that kind of, that kind of contagion speak, right? But at the same time, it's very differentially experienced. So I'll just give you one example here. And that is um, the sort of app, uh, you, you know, this networked app uh, or, or three apps that were brought in together. So this is Foreign Worker Ministry of Manpower Care, shortened to FWMOM Care, and the SG Work Pass and Trace Together. So FWMOM Care, uh, is a way for workers to monitor and self-regulate their own temperature. They've been given thermometers and oximeters and they have to register that twice daily. SG Work Pass is tied to FWMOM Care app that allows employers to check if a worker is permitted to leave the dorm, but you have to have that FWMOM Care app for the SG Work Pass app to work. And the SG Work Pass app will show um, that a worker is not allowed to leave unless they have downloaded Trace Together. So there's an interconnected system uh, that allows intimate, uh, intimate surveillance of migrant bodies. And you know, uh, one of the early uh, another example, really quick, was wastewater surveillance. That was certainly tested there as well, where you can look for um, viral RNA in the sewage system, and then you could. Uh, and, and I think that's that has since been rolled out in different places in Singapore, but that was one of the places, first places where it was tested. That's quite invasive uh, indeed. Um, just, uh, just to say that, as I uh, mentioned just now, we've seen this uh, before, the, the idea that certain technologies are tested on marginalized populations before. We had a conversation, for instance, about the European Union's experimentation with uh, surveillance technologies on refugee uh, populations and migrants at its uh, borders. And um, in a way, the selective deployment of technologies is about experimentation. Uh, so governments or international organizations exploiting low right spaces, if you will, uh, at the fringes to test out new technologies on certain uh, more vulnerable populations. Now, we were wondering how that then connects to the concept of uh, the smart city. In other words, um, is it a central tenet of the smart city uh, to experiment since innovation is also such a crucial uh, um, notion in the whole concept of uh, the smart city. And I was triggered um, uh, to ask that question uh, by a recent article uh, titled The Testbed Island, where researchers investigated, and I quote, how the smart nation innovation program was conceived of as an example of tech business experimentalism and defined Singapore as an exceptional territory and a territory of exception. So my question would be, do you think that experimentation is inherent to smart cities, uh, including in, uh, in Singapore? Uh, 
Absolutely. And that, that article is really great. That's a, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, Police Laurent, and um, I'm really excited that you have touched upon that article. So that it's absolutely spot on in terms of thinking of Singapore as an exceptional space where tech business experimentalism can occur. And really there's a very low barrier for trying out different technologies and having different kinds of really socio-technical experiments provided that they're in line with national priorities. So, you know, you could develop wastewater surveillance um, to monitor sewage water from everything from coronavirus to explosives because it dovetailed with um, Singapore's smart city initiatives and national priorities. Um, but experimentation, you know, is, is something that we often think about as uh, the who is the experimenter and who is being experimented on. And to that degree, I think uh, to that question, it's one thing to try to try out different policies and apps and technologies on people who trust that the government has its best interests at heart, but it's quite another to try it out um, on people with such little power. So <clears throat> the dorms in these cases were definitely construed as spaces of exception within the self-branded space of you know, exceptionalism that is Singapore. And this was a place where migrant bodies needed to be disciplined and regulated in specific ways to help the community, outside communities, right? But also for their own health, you know, it, it seemed. So um, ultimately, this idea of an experimental testing society, it's not just restricted to the dorms, but ultimately we're all um, can be tested upon. But the degree and kind of experiments differ based on what kind of exceptional space you occupy within Singapore. Thanks. I have one more question on uh, the treatment of migrant workers. And um, that's because in our line of work, we, uh, we want to make sure that these conversations about technological developments in the state are not just about sort of uh, abstract notions and concepts, but they also foreground the human impact uh, of technologies in question. And uh, in, in that context, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how this disproportionate surveillance uh, and experimentation uh, on migrant workers was experienced uh, by these workers. Um, what do they conceive of as the real harms? Yeah, and here I just want to be careful and not to overgeneralize because there was this, in a lot of my interviewees, there was this move to become, to be seen by the Singapore government as a good worker, as someone who was a disciplined person. So people would say things like, I like the law and order in Singapore. I follow it. I'm okay with being surveilled and monitored. And I would gladly pay that price to be surveilled if only I can go outside the dormitory compound, right? So it's it's some so it's 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 um, a little bit more complicated than saying that it, there was only harms associated with it. There was some desires to have that in exchange for some freedoms, right? To be actually part of that social contract, to try to forge their own social contract. But at the same time, of course, there are disproportionate harms. And I think it really needs to be, you know, emphasized that the very infrastructure of surveillance, of concentrating migrants in dorms for 12 to 20 people for the purpose of more effective surveillance has hyper exposed them to the, uh, to the pandemic, to infection their exclusion from Singaporean society uh, gave rise to the very conditions that created the high numbers of infections among the ranks to begin with. <clears throat> and of course, there are a whole host of different mental health consequences of being isolated, you know, being excluded from certain parts of public life, of being treated by some Singaporeans as viral vectors. And I have from a reliable source that from April through August of 2020, there were about two suicides a week. And of course, they talk about suicide and depression and they're not always taken seriously. And a lot of NGOs have responded to this by, you know, talking about yoga and mindfulness as if, you know, I, I know people mean well, but it's kind of hard to do that when you can, you can't really yoga your way out of precarity. Um, but beyond mental health, there are all sorts of other things of, you know, facing the endless limbo of, um, of being able to, when are you going to be able to work if you're ill or you've sustained injuries or, you know, trying to pay back debt and how long cases take to be processed. And, and coming back to the smart nation, like some people just don't know why their apps show up as red and 
and they don't know how to fix that. They're just stuck in this digital limbo. And um, so that's, those are some of the harms that you talked about. Sorry, I've gone on a long time, but yeah. No, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Monami. I think especially in highlighting the mental health um, impacts of all of this is, is such an important thing that needs to be talked about and that we see across so many of the digital government programs that we look at within our work. Uh, this sense of helplessness, the isolation um, is, is, is a spectrum across all of the digital government programs. And in light of some of these harms, I want to kind of perhaps try and end on a more positive note uh, within our kind of questioning and ask about um, efforts that have been made to kind of resist some of these trends. Um, so particularly to kind of tie all of this back to your discussion right at the beginning um, of the CMIO system of racial categories. Um, so much of the experimentation and surveillance that you've described as disproportionate is quite explicitly racialized in terms of, you know, you've mentioned apps that are only deployed on migrant workers. And of course, these migrant workers predominantly um, come from Bangladesh and India. Um, you've written in your in your um, Smart Nation piece about how civic energy has recently been kind of unleashed in Singapore and previously taboo topics such as racial inequality and the fairness of the legal system as well um, are now being much more openly discussed within Singaporean society. Um, so to what extent has there been mobilization in Singapore against the technological developments that you've described and particularly the racial inequality that comes into these developments? So let me just say that I, I have a feeling, I mean, so my, when I wrote that, this was based on what colleagues were telling me about what was taboo to discuss and what wasn't, right? And I get the feeling that these conversations periodically come up and then die down again. <clears throat> and, but while I was in Singapore for three years, it was quite amazing to see that things that people told me they didn't talk about before, things like race or Chinese privilege or, um, things like uh, uh, death penalty or minimum wage, people were, there's a lot of energy in talking about that. And I think that kind of spilled over to talking about technology. But that said, activism is still considered a dirty word in, in, in Singapore. And so, um, so I wouldn't like mobilization and activism, these are certainly there, they're really great people doing that work but I wouldn't say that there's that kind of level of mobilization in Singapore. But at the same time, there are certain things that have happened. So when the Trace Together um, app was first considered to be made mandatory, there was a petition against that. And people were talking about, you know, why are there no sunset clauses of when this is gonna be discontinued? Um, what will be done with this connected, collected data? What about privacy? And after Vivian Balakrishnan, who was a minister um, heading up the Smart Nation Initiative at the time, he defended Trace Together and said it didn't track or use data for criminal proceedings. Of course, it kind of did those things later on. But that kind of, um, to, to my knowledge, nothing else was done after that, after that kind of Facebook exchange. Um, you have all these engineers that the government, GovTech, who's the organization who rolled out Trace Together, uh, and they've had some hackathons, but these are still very elite spaces. And so, and then you've got other people like the so-called thick-headed Singaporeans who are hacking their trace together tokens or having Faraday cages and they're creative ways of resisting smaller ways. So not like very overt, um, you know, uh, hard ways, but other ways in which people are doing this and writing about it. And of course, people are afraid of being censored somehow, but this is not to say that um, there are not eddies of activism and resistance going on. Thanks so much, uh, Monami. Uh, we're, we're coming to the hour. We have 10 more minutes left. So I wanted to go to the Q&A now to make sure that we ask some of the great questions that have been asked in, uh, in the Q&A. And uh, I wanted to start with a question asked by uh, Yoti Raja. Sorry if I mispronounced that name. Um, she or he writes, thank you for your very important research on the excluded foreign worker in relation to the smart nation. Are you also able to speak uh, to the smart nation in relation to the citizen underclass? No, I am not able to speak to that. And that is a great question. And the thing is in Singapore, like studying, I mean, studying class and especially how class is raced sometimes in Singapore is very tricky. And I think that there is so much work that needs to be done. And I know there are some great people doing this work, but um, 
And if I find any of this literature, I will certainly send it to you guys so you can post it maybe or something. Uh, but I don't have, I, I can't speak to that, but I'm, I would be shocked if there wasn't some implications for, you know, um, uh, the underclass, uh, the working class in this, especially in how decisions are getting made um, for welfare organizations and getting and housing I'm, and, and how AI and the smart nation is, or, or yeah, how AI and digital um, or how data is being used. I think there's probably a lot there, but I'm sorry, I'm, I can't speak to that. Absolutely. I mean, we will be sharing um, a, a summary blog and the video and, and a lot of resources um, after this session ends. And so we can definitely um, include some materials on that as well. It's a really important question, I think. Um, we also have a question from Cynthia conti -Cook. Um, Sorry if I've mispronounced that as well. Um, and they're asking, can you describe the policing and criminal legal system in Singapore and how smart nation data and technology is used within the, the criminal system? So I am also not an expert on how, uh, how the police are using it. I do know that they are using it. And that has been a big um, point of contention and sort of uh, a point of mis generating mistrust between citizens and the state of how data that was supposed to be used solely for contact tracing is now being used by the police. I mean, there is in the, in, in the, um, in the effort to create this perfect all-knowing graph of all, the, all these bits of data um, it's really quite uh, obscure and hidden from public view how this data is actually being recombined and <clears throat> being shaped to influence decision making and uh, in those spaces and how they're tracking people or trying to find you know crime uh, I don't whatever that may be so um, I can't speak to how that how the smart nation intersects with the criminal um, or, or crime fighting, you know, arms of Singapore society. But I know that this is a gold mine that people will not pass up because almost in all cases around the world, when you have this kind of data generated, it often is used for finding all sorts of, um, you know, information about us and trying to help in criminal investigations. Thanks so much, uh, Monami. And, and just to say, I think it's very important to also say so when you don't know the answer to uh, a question. Uh, it's one of the major lessons in public speaking, of course, to never go beyond your area of, uh, of expertise. So I think uh, uh, that's great that you're being honest there. Uh, or I don't one... know a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I beg to differ. Um, we have a question uh, by Devi uh, who asks, um, linking to what Victoria has just said, would you have any recommendations on how people within Singapore should engage and push for more autonomy within a smart nation where initiatives are led and pushed for by the government without input from individuals, whether migrant or otherwise, civil society or other stakeholders. And this is linked to the experience of why NGO, uh, adv NGOs advocate for mindfulness or yoga support, for example, as they operate keenly within a framework where they know what their power and engagement is limited and can be more restricted if they are seen to, for example, violate race and discrimination laws, et cetera. Great this is question. a great, this is a great question indeed. And the thing about activism in Singapore is that, you know, as you, as you indicated in your question, you, NGOs and people and academics, anybody who is trying to push against state narratives are always treading a fine line between <clears throat> how to engage with the state and maintain their legitimacy without suffering more punitive measures, right? Um, there are people who have, um, oh, this is a great publication that, that, that's um, been published here on the chat, but there are a lot of people who are really treading this fine line and very carefully and very um, cleverly, I would say, you know, and pushing the boundaries in certain kinds of ways, like, yes, perhaps there is mindfulness and yoga, but there's also a lot of support for bread and butter issues like, you know, uh, trying to get cases processed or trying to get um, injuries taken care of 
So there's those kinds of things going on. There isn't as much on the technological aspect, but that's because it's been it's been designed to be part of the woodwork. It's so um, constitutive of the social contract that I've talked about that questioning the technology is almost questioning, it is, it is questioning that social contract that citizens have forged with the state. And so for people to, you know, you know I'm in Denmark and in Denmark, everybody talks a lot and they all get together in a circle and they all talk together and then they come to a conclusion, these consensus conferences, and these have been sort of really shaped academic scholarship on what kind of, what participatory deliberation should look like around the world. And of course, one can already imagine that the Danish model doesn't work everywhere. And in Singapore, there are certain modes of, you know, who counts as an expert? What kind of knowledge is considered legitimate? What are the standards of and criteria for um, what counts as good evidence and a good argument, all of these things have to be, are part and parcel of the Singaporean political culture. So to say that there should be more participation, there should be more this and more that, that's also a very liberal way of looking at it. That said, there are people there who are trying to push the boundaries and trying to think of, of ways to do this. And one thing that I think is really important is to bring in the voices and to convince elites and the technocrats and the people in hackathons that the voices of people who are the non-elites, who are the underclass and the denizens, so uh, those who work in the hawker centers or taxi drivers or whoever, have something to add to these conversations. These conversations where they may not know the technical details, but they certainly know about what this technology means to themselves and their lives and how they've experienced it. And this is not just user information, it's about uh, talking about hopes and dreams and what they believe the future of Singapore, what they fear, their, their fears are. And I'm sure there is some way to bring that in, but it requires convincing of elite in elite spaces that this can be important. And that might mean negotiations and compromises and it's not going to be this pure place where people can deliberate. It will have to work with the existing political culture. But um, one way to get through that is to perhaps have more representatives, more boundary actors who can sort of bridge between uh, these different communities. And I think that's something that activists and, and academics are trying to do in Singapore. Maybe one last uh, um, question or comment from the audience uh, for you to respond to, Monami, very briefly uh, before we have to wrap up. Uh, and um, that, that comes from Gunther, who sort of expresses uh, uh, an alternative view on uh, the smart uh, city technologies that we've discussed. Um, they, uh, they write, I love my token and my Trace Together app, keeps me safe from unvaccinated people and uh, writes, in which other large city in the world can you walk in every part of the city safely? As an elderly, I appreciate the cameras. I was just wondering if you could briefly respond to that, what you, what you think of those, uh, those comments. Yeah, absolutely. And I totally understand that point of view because I kind of had that point of view when I was living in Singapore. I was so thankful that I was not in the United States, which during the, you know, not to get, well, to get political, the Trump administration, it seemed like things were crazy and there was so much uncertainty. I was so thankful that I was in Singapore where people were very, it seemed like a very, call, you know, drawing on the history from SARS, there was order, there was agreement, there was trust. That was very important. But at the same time, this kind of stability can get quite seductive. And this is sort of the dangerous or, you know, the slippery slope is what are all the other, parts, the inequalities that are being hidden within the stability. And I completely get that. And I think that's a valid point. And that is probably a, uh, that is probably a view that uh, many people share. But that kind of view is um, shared by, I, I guess it's hegemonic, you know, it's people who agree with that. But there are a lot of people um, you know, and I'm thinking of migrant workers, I'm thinking of others who have a different kind of idea of 
what safety looks like, you know? And I am vaccinated, I believe in vaccinations, but there's been a lot of great literature about the so-called vaccine hesitancy and anti-vaxxers out there too, about why people are hesitant. So there has to be space for these kinds of um, contrary viewpoints to come out too. And maybe in the end, you know, we're still going to have that political stability, that technological uh, infrastructure that allows this, but um, at the same time, um, you know, I, I, it can be a very slippery slope. On, on that note, we have to end, unfortunately, we're at our hour. And I wanna thank you, uh, Monami, for a very interesting uh, conversation and uh, exchange with the audience. And also wanna thank our audience for all their great questions and, uh, and, and comments. Unfortunately, we couldn't address them all, but uh, I think we uh, addressed many of them. Also, just to say that I, uh, I would love to coin that phrase, uh, you can't yoga your way out of precarity. I understand we had a whole discussion about uh, putting that in into context, but it's a great uh, it's a great quote to be honest. Um, just to reiterate, reiterate to our audience that we've recorded this conversation and uh, that we will soon make it uh, available on our YouTube channel uh, and also on our website, uh, and that allows you to either watch it again or uh, share it with others, or perhaps use it in uh, in your teaching or in your uh, advocacy. And uh, once this uh, uh, recording is available, we will also publish a, a summary blog on our website. We will make a lot of the uh, materials that we referred to during our conversation today available uh, on our website uh, as well. Uh, I also wanted to say at the end that we want to welcome you again next month on Wednesday, 30 March, uh, to our next conversations in this uh, series, when we will be joined by human rights expert uh, Bas Peña, uh, with whom we will discuss the childhood alert system in Chile, uh, which is an early warning system uh, based on algorithmic predictions that assigns risk scores to children and adolescents, and that will hopefully uh, be as fascinating a conversation as uh, today's. Again, Monami, thank you so much for your time, and the same goes to our audience. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, everyone.